Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I'm Dan Nevins for the National Piping Centre, and you are watching The Piping Show, filmed live here in the auditorium of the National Piping Centre in Glasgow. This week's show is super cool, super important. We've got ducks, we've got news, and I'll be honest, we've been scraping the barrel for some guests, so we've had to go and annoy people that are staying in the hotel. Luckily for you, that happens to be the reigning Glenfiddich champion, Dr Jack Lee. Jack comes all the way from British Columbia in Canada, and I'll be honest, he's won everything he can win in piping. Um, you'll be familiar with the name if you've not heard him play, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you've never heard him speak. So today we've got a lovely chat that we've just finished before I started recording this. But first, before you do anything else, if you haven't clicked like and subscribe yet, please do like the video, hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit the little dingley bell so that you get notified for every uh, video that comes out from the National Piping Centre. But before we get to that great interview, here's Helen Urquhart with the news. There were a number of events that took place across the piping world last weekend. In Benderloch, the Loch Nell Intermediate Youth Piping Championship run by the Argyllshire Gathering took place in Loch Nell Castle. The Peabrook event was won by Andrew Ferguson and the March Just Bay and Reel event was won by Rory Brown. The Festival of Juvenile Solo Piping took place in Stevenson in Ayrshire as well. The Junior Championship was won by Owen McCready and the Senior Championship was won by Gregor Grierson. The Piping and Pipe Band Society of Ontario also celebrated their 75th anniversary this weekend with a large Cayley. Coming up this weekend we have the Glenfiddich Piping Championship taking place in Blair Castle. Advanced online tickets for this event have now sold out, however there will be tickets available on the door on the day. The live stream will also be available from 10am on Saturday morning. You can find out more details about all of this at www.thepipingcentre.co.uk forward slash Glenfiddich. The National Piping Centre was sad to hear of the passing of Andrew Wright on the 23rd of October. He was a top competitor in both solo and pipe band worlds and was the Peabrook Society president for many years. We know he'll be truly missed. We send our condolences to his family at this time. If you have any news or results you would like to send us for this section of the piping show, please email them to news at bagpipe.news. And now over to Dr. Andrew Bova for this week's history. Hello there. This weekend we'll see pipers from all around the world make the journey to Blair Castle to witness the 49th annual Glenfiddich Solo Piping Championship. I thought today we might take a look back at the first Glenfiddich Solo Piping Championship and its winner, Jimmy McIntosh, MBE. The Glenfiddich was founded in 1974 and was originally called the Grants Championship. Later on, the name changed to the Glenfiddich Championship. And as I mentioned, Jimmy McIntosh was the first winner. Jimmy was born in 1925 in Broddy Ferry near Dundee. At the age of 14, he enlisted in the Army, where he would receive tuition from Pipe Major Donald McLeod and Pipe Major Willie Ross. In 1965, he began taking lessons with Bob Brown and later Bob Nickel of the famous Bobs of Balmoral. This would prove to be a seminal moment in Jimmy's career, as he would go on to dedicate much of his piping career to passing on the teachings of Bob Brown and Bob Nickel, and through them, John McDonald of Inverness. Jimmy was an incredibly successful solo competitor. In addition to his Grants Championship win, he also won the gold medal at Inverness in 1971, playing Tala Guard, and at Oban in 1978, playing the Big Spree. Jimmy was nothing if not a hard worker, and there's not enough time in this to talk about all of his achievements in his life, but of particular note for our competing pipers is that in 1976, he founded the Competing Pipers Association, and in 1977, went on to found the first silver medal competition held at the Northern Meeting at Inverness of that year. In 1982, Jimmy would emigrate to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the USA. In 1985, he was hired by Carnegie Mellon University to revive their, at that point, defunct pipe band program. Again, Jimmy never being one to do things the easy way, decided in 1990 to launch the world's first dedicated bagpipe degree program, of which I am an alumni, but more importantly, Nick Hudson is an alumni. Nick, of course, having just won the gold medal at Inverness, will be competing this weekend at the Glenfiddich Championship as a former student of Jimmy's. To that end, best of luck to Nick Hudson and all of the competitors competing this weekend at the Glenfiddich Solo Piping Championship.
Hello, Jack. Welcome to the Pipe Show. Thank you very much for talking to us today. You're uh, my first question for you is um, a, a statement that has been bandied around players in the, the, the lower grades for a wee while. We all hear that you don't believe in sleep. Is that true? Uh, that's actually not true. But I'm one of these strange people that don't require a lot of sleep. Mm -hmm. So I don't need a lot of sleep. My family would probably confirm that. Um, and when I come over here, which is an eight hour time difference, mm -hmm. I've always struggled with jet lag. It takes me kind of a week to get you know, my regular sleeping patterns, but I do believe in sleep. <laughs> I just don't need a whole lot of it, fortunately. Well, that's very lucky, I'm quite <laughs> the opposite. I seem to need more than anybody else. Um, but I suppose it brings us right into to preparation. You are the reigning Lindfiddich champion. Um, you're here to defend your title. Um, so I, I suppose the thing is, I think we all imagine, uh, you know what it is, I think Pipers believe in magic. That's what it is. I think Pipers believe that a magic chanter, a magic read, a magic this, a, a, a special word from your, your tutor is going to make you a great Piper. But at this point in your career, having won, I mean, I, I can't think of a, a major prize you haven't won, um, but has it, does it change in the kind of, let's call it, the rundown to the big event? Okay, my, my preparation for the Glenfiddich has changed over the years as I've gotten older. I mean, if I practice now, like I was practicing in my 20s, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Mm. It's like 60 year old needs to go about things differently. Having said that, um, the word that comes to mind, the word that I try to uh, implement myself is thorough. I try to be thorough and uh, at least work on the things, and, you know, the physical things, musical things. The bagpipe is very, very important that the bagpipe be where you want it. So. Uh, the preparation for the Glenfiddich for me begins way before the Glenfiddich and I do a lot of um, sort of going through reads and, and trying options and working on the bagpipe and getting myself physically fit and all that to play and I, I spend a lot of time in the music. I love the music so much mm -hmm. and I hear other, like to hear other people play the tunes I'm playing and I like to play them myself and record them and play them back and, and try to figure out how to improve on that. So. Again, I try to be thorough in those three areas, and uh, there is no such thing as magic <laughs> uh, as far as just presto and you can play your best. It doesn't work that way, for sure. It needs to be prepared and organized. So in your kind of preparation, now playing at the kind of former winners level, um, you know, there are set tunes, there are some big changes coming in from the Peebra Society um, about what tunes are getting played at that level. Um, do you find yourself looking for reference material, material or is it like from your own career, from other people's playing, um, or is there a set method you use for picking up things? No, I, I look for re reference material all the time. I love hearing other pipers play my tunes. I just love hearing Willie and Roddy and Stuart and Angus and Ian and Finley and Callum and all, all that crowd that's so, they're great pipers now. And the generations before, if you can find Sort of Murray Henderson and Bill Livingston and Ian mm. McFadge and all, John Wilson, all these great players that have been out there and I've heard them in my career, love hearing them all play and if they play my tunes, I think that's a bonus for me, I get to hear them play it and I, but just in terms of bouncing ideas around in my own mind. So um, I'm, I'm not one of these, just play it my way and, mm. and nobody else's way. Having said that, when it gets close to competitions time, I, I don't want to hear other people play my tunes now. I, I've done all that, I've heard the different approaches, and now this is how I'm playing them. Uh, good or bad, I will go down that, that path with my tunes based on all the source of inputs beforehand. So, mm -hmm. um, so what's, like, in terms of tunes that you've maybe played, I can only assume that like, like everybody else, you'll go through times where you go, um, these are my tunes, and then you'll go actually see X, I'm going to get rid of X and bring something. But is there any examples of tunes that have developed from, you know, maybe 20 years ago you were playing it based on whatever, and now it's changed? Yeah, for sure. Little, the Little Cascade comes to my mind right away. Um, I heard The Little Cascade back in the 80s, and the first person I ever heard play that tune was Alan Stavell, the great French harpist. What? It wasn't even a piper. And I thought, man, that is so good. Love that tune. So I've been trying to play that tune for 40 mm. years. And a few years ago, I kind of went off of the Cascade. I wasn't happy with how I was playing it and all of that. And when I did that, I kind of vowed to bring it back at some point before I retire. I want to play the Cascade a few more times. So I have brought the Cascade back and I've just continued to listen to it and study it. 
And I think, I think a tune as complex as a little cascade is kind of a lifetime study. Mm. And I would use that to describe many of these great key rocks. They are a lifetime study. And if, you, if you're willing to go down that path, you, you'll never find out, run out of things to, to work mm. on and improve. And so that comes to mind right away. Um, a number of my key rocks I've, have come in and out of my repertoire over the years. Um, tunes that are back in for me very, you know, very, really love playing are the Lament for the Earl of Antrim, Ronald McDonald of Moore's a uh, tune I just love playing so much. So they come and go a little bit, mm -hmm. and um, I do have, a, I would say, a pretty large repertoire of tunes that I play and I love, to, love playing. But when it gets down to something like the Glamphitic, which is really serious, you put your best tunes forward, the mm -hmm. tunes that you feel confident that you can play well, you enjoy playing, and all that. So mm -hmm. no more experimentation when it comes to yeah. preparing for the Glamphitic. I suppose a question that I think a lot of our viewers will, uh, will have is, what does it feel like on the stage in Blair Athol? That's a great stage. I've always said it's a great stage. The pipes sound fantastic on that stage. And it's a great ambiance to the crowd and all that. Mm -hmm. The only exception to that was in was 2020 when the pandemic was on. Um, I have, just happened to be the last person in the MSR and uh, there was no audience that year. Mm -hmm. So I just happened to be the last person that played. I finished my MSR. I thought it went quite well. I was pretty happy. I stopped playing. And one lonely guy at the back of the hall was clapping like the, like the janitor or somebody. <laughs> it was really depressing. <laughs> but normally, the crowd is magnificent, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the acoustics on that stage are great, and the atmosphere. It's hard to picture a, a better place to play bagpipes, really, than the, the great hall at uh, Blair Castle. And I, I suppose, for, for, okay, I keep referencing the audience. A lot of our audience would never have, have journeyed to, to Scotland to attend. Um, and we'll have imaginings of the realities of playing in that, that contest. Why I've heard from other long-term competitors um, who will remain nameless is that until you're on stage, it's not quite real yet. You know, would you say that's a fair point? I, I, I would say so, yeah. yeah. Something happens when you enter that stage, you know, it's very serious and it's a great atmosphere and you, there's a, I think performers would mostly say that you get nervous beforehand. Mm. But when you're actually beginning your play, you, the nerves go away and you're kind of in your zone. And I, mm. I find that many times on that stage. Blow up, the pipes are where you want them. It's a great feeling, a mm. calming feeling. And then at that point, the piper can just focus on playing the music well, you know. Mm. You're one of the, the lucky few that has competed against one of your own students at the Glenfiddich as well. I have, I referred to Alan Bevan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a great story about that. Alan is a, a great friend and a great, great piper. And I've known Alan since he was a boy. Anyway, that particular year at the Glen uh, I had a, I was playing my McDougals in those days and they had a crack in the bass drum and I was a little bit leery about playing them, but they were beautiful sound when they were going well. Anyway, all the moisture and the cool air, the crack opened up and my pipes were a train wreck in the pea rock. So then I, oh brother, now what am I gonna do? So <laughs> Alan, would you mind if I borrowed your pipes for the, uh, for the MSR? Mm. And um, being afraid, of, absolutely no problem. Well, unfortunately, he was on immediately before me. Oh, and then he came up, so he plays his MSR, and it gets off, and people are kind of high-fiving him, and he just wasn't so quickly coming up the hall because people are interrupting him. Mm. And I'm going like, dude, I need to get up tuning <laughs> these pipes. So he passed me the pipes in the tuning room. I blew them up. I could not have played them for more than 10 seconds. And then the steward, Logan Tannock, is right there. Jack, time to go, time yeah. to go. Oh, man. So I just went down the hall on this bagpipe. I only played for 10 seconds. And would you believe when the prizes came out, I actually got first in the end of the <laughs> I don't know. When I blew them up on the stage, I thought, whoa, these are what mine used to sound like before these cracks occurred. Mm -hmm. So I have always thanked Alan for loading me his pipes at the big moment. You know? yeah. I mean, that, that does sound like a living an anxiety nightmare. <laughs> like those dreams you have where you try to leave the house and you can't find your pipe case. This is, this is falling in the category of not being thorough and oh, anticipating suppose. that these pipes might have a problem when you get to the castle. And I suppose that, that might be an issue that a lot of pipers face is like, um, there's, there can be a complacency that sets in. You know, I think we've all experienced a time when we've went, I, I'll get away with that, that'll be okay. Yeah. You know, it's even today, the, this morning I came into work and played my pipes, I'm getting ready for London, um, and 
I played through four MSRs, two P bricks, and I went, at the end of it, I thought, is that Reed starting? <laughs> is it? You know, and I've got spare chanters going, I'm not worried about it, but I'm only not worried about it because I've got spare chanters going. When you come over, having had an experience like that, which, I mean, that's on a knife edge, really, isn't it? Um, what, do you do anything extra to make sure you get backups? I do, and I, I do way more now than I used to. I've, I've done the Glen Fiddick a number of times on one read, and it, it's really going well, you like playing it, and you don't want to mess with it. So mm -hmm. you do that, but when you, prior to the Glen Fiddick, you're doing a lot of playing, and it's hard on the read. The read ages a lot. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, I, I paid for that a couple of times. The read wasn't so good when I got out there as I thought it might be. Now when I come over, I come over with three reads and two chanters. And when I, when I arrive, I want to feel like I could put in chanter number two and read number two and feel confident with it. So I'm actually in that position right now. I've played a lot of P-Brox on my backup chanter and these two reads. So I know that feeling. Um, it's disruptive to be changing reads before a major contest. You really just want to hit, hit the play button and go. Yeah. So that's why we tend to overplay these things. See in terms of the stick that you're playing, uh, if I remember correctly, it's nail chanters you play? No, no that's all changed. So the, the pipes, these are not my pipes, by the way, but the drones are made by our company, Lee and Sons mm -hmm. Bagpipes. My son, Andrew, makes the, makes the pipes. We also make the pipe bag, uh, and I play a zippered sheepskin bag, which we make. So that's the core of it. The pipe chanter itself was made by McCallum Bagpipes. Old friends, Willie and, and Stuart McCallum, designed a special chanter for me because I had to have the holes in just to suit me better. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the reeds, I don't mind telling you, are uh, pretty standard for me. I play canon tenor reeds, and I'm playing an octobu yellow ace reed. Well, sometimes usually that's... Uh, <laughs> I'm playing the opposite. Oh, I'm playing the other way around. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just what, what your pipes... The are, like. They really suit my pipes really, yeah. really well. Uh, uh, the chanter reed is kind of, a, kind of a laugh because what happened in the chanter reed is uh, in 2020, when they, there was no audience, and that guy was one lone guy was clapping. When I came off of, on that from that MSR, I thought, man, the, my pipe sounded so good. I was so happy with the way the pipe sounded, mm. and so I had this kind of idea: maybe I should just keep these reeds aside and, and try them next year. So I got home to Vancouver. I, the reed was in a bottle. It sat on my desk for 11 months. Never looked at it once. Mm. And so, getting ready for the Glenfiddich at 21. I'm going through various reads, and I pull this read out of 2020's bottle, and I thought, oh man, that's my best read. I gotta play that again. So, so I did that, and it went well last year and whatnot. Came off in 2021 with the same idea. I put the read in a bottle and, and didn't look at it for a long time. And I've gone through all these various reads and, and stuff this summer, and I brought back my 2020 read. It's still my best read. So, <laughs> street over, hey? I know, I, I wish I'd, thought of this idea years ago, I'd have a lot less gray hair today, mm -hmm. if I realized you could just find a great read, don't play it, and just put it out there when you're at your major contest. Mm -hmm. So that would be my recommendation for pipers out there. Mm -hmm. Don't overplay your best read, save it for a major contest. I learned that late in my career. Yeah, so is that, that's like a Lee and Sons read, Chant read? That particular read is not, it's a, was, that read is interesting because it's 20, it, well over 20 years old. Oh, right. It was a Ross Reed from California. Wow. Ross was a really accomplished read maker back yeah. in the day. And yeah, I just found this box of reads and it just suited me really just, well. I mean, it's whatever works, you know, whatever goes. Um, but what I was going to ask about the, about the chanters though was um, do you find much variance in them? I mean, even, I know McCallum's are, are, are um, prolific in the, the standard of manufacture, but Blackwood's Blackwood. It's not always the same. Did you have to go through a process to get three chanters? that you go, we're able to, like for example, I've got two RGMs and one of them I picked myself and one of them Roddy picked. And the chanter Roddy picked is a very, very good chanter, but it's a lot higher pitch than the one I picked. So if I, when I change over, there's quite a lot of difference in the drones. The sound quality's changed because of the, the pitch change. Um, I can find it a little jarring. I mean, do you have that issue? Did you, were you conscious of that issue? Or? I am, and um, I think the, the, the standard of chanter making has just gone so high mm -hmm. in the last few years, it's just great. And all the makers make excellent product. But for me, I'm a very dry blower. I have a different requirement than most other pipers. So what I've had to do, I cannot take a chanter off the rack and play mm -hmm. it successfully, usually. 
the top hand is too sharp, the bottom hand is too flat because of the way I am. So mm. anyway, they moved the holes for me. So, I, so I'm a little bit different than other people that I have to have it sort of specially lined up for my breath. Where other pipers can get a typical chanter from these top makers and be very I successful. That. I cannot do that without moving the holes or carving. Mm. Carving the holes really excessively. Yeah. So I imagine you just said you have everything. It did, yeah. Yeah. My, my top hand is well done. Yeah. But bottom hand up yeah. a little as well. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's intriguing. Like the, the just the... There's a funny thing between like um, old drones and new chanters, where people are like even even the the models that are popular now tend to be um, re replications of classic makers, uh, which I don't think there's anything wrong with. I guess. How many ways are that it's kind of cat? But at the, at the same time, you go like even um, the, the the vintage bagpipe market is <laughs> what I've been calling it. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions made about. You know, this, this, when I get a set of 1910 lorries, that would be me, I'll sound like Roddy does. And, and you go, well, actually, there's a lot of prep work that goes in. So in terms of getting the quality of sound out of the instrument, um, you'll have a vision in your head. But I think what's interesting about, at this point in your career, I mean, um, I'm going to borrow a phrase of my mother's, there's more behind you than there is in front of you. Um, yeah, she's very uh, affluent that way. Affluent, ah, never mind. Um, the, the thing I'm trying to get at though is, considering the, the difference in the bagpipe you'd have played, say, in the late 1970s, when you first came to prominence, and the bagpipe you're playing now, other than the pitch change, the quality of sound you're looking for, has that changed? Okay, and that's a really good question. And I, I always feel like the tone comes from your head. You hear it in your head. And my, all my fellow colleagues and competitors are, I think, the same. We hear the tone we want in our heads, in our minds, and you can kind of take a random set of bagpipes and stuff, and given enough time, each of us would get the sound, pretty much the sound that we want, and that we would more or less perform with. So, having said that, I like a certain type of sound, I like a very rich sound, I like a, a full top hand, I like a a blending set of drones with a nice deep bass and, and those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, we've done that over the last few decades with very much different technology. Uh, when pipers got control of moisture, that was a big, big advancement in piping. That started in the 70s. And we've all done that. The pitch of the pipes have come way, way up. And that's good and bad, I would say. Um, it becomes a little more fragile. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew IG is an issue. And when I was back in the 70s, I never remember, ever remember even thinking about a Pibrock IG on the Hardy Chanter and the, and the Sinclair Chanter. They were just always really stable, really nice. Mm -hmm. Now it's a big deal. Yep. And I have to be careful about your read selection and stuff. So I guess my point is I, I feel like I'm still getting the same type of sound that I've always enjoyed, but at a much higher pitch and with different technology and, and, and whatnot today. So. And listening to the band of the worlds this year, very impressed. I mean, for those of us um, who are uh, living in Scotland that day, those two days were nightmarish, hellish because of the heat. For you guys, maybe a little easier, at least you would have known what to do, whereas we just did nothing and waited. Um, but you're probably the only top six band playing a, a dryer system in the bag. So is that like, uh, is that your experiential influence? into the band, or was that like a combined, we have an issue here that can be resolved this way? That's because we come on airplanes and fly over here. Mm. And I think if we lived in Scotland, we would have a much different setup. The, the pipes become used to it, and a lot of the other top bands can play, and it's you know, raining, it's wet weather all week, and they still sound great. For us, as a North American band, we come over here, and it's, except for this year, usually much wetter and much cooler. Mm. And if you don't have stuff in your, in your bagpipe to protect it, you will be a train wreck mm -hmm. in 15 or 20 minutes. That's what happens. And if we stayed for a few weeks, the pipe would become used to it. Okay. So, so we are set up when we, when we came over here for moisture mm -hmm. with, with stuff in the bag and, and this sort of thing. We all play sheepskin and, and goatskin and we, we make the bags for the band and all that. We have, but we have systems inside there to keep us dry. And now as it turned out, we didn't need all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. well, this is just the first time in my <laughs> career that I can every member not having to take the Inverness cape out of my suitcase. They just say to my suitcase the entire trip, never needed it once. Yeah. So, 
Um, so I guess we're kind of anticipating it'll be back to normal next year. Oh yeah, I mean, it's no guarantees. What one extreme or the other? I'm afraid that's that's Scotland. Um, if the if the people don't get you, the weather will. Uh, Jack, that'll have to do us. Thank you very much for coming My on. Pleasure, it's been man. absolute pleasure. Thank you, and best of luck Thank at the weekend as well. Much.